Welcome to Dr. Roger and Friends, the bright side of longevity, hosted by three peas in a podcast, Doc Roger, Teresa, and Danielle. Thanks for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. Welcome to Becoming the Architect of Your Cognitive Future, how to make your brain stronger, smarter, sharper every day. So, you know, um, a few years ago, I felt this kind of brain fog, and I was a little concerned about it because, you know, dementia does run in the family, and I'm like, am am I starting to see signs? And maybe you've experienced this. You're on a team call, and somebody's asking for your input, and you realize you just spaced out and can't remember what somebody just asked you, or, you know, you're going to your friend's house, and maybe you've only been there once, and you're like, I knew I wrote down the number. Where did I put the address house number? You know, and just the problem solving, just the, the fatigue. And, you know, Roger, I read your book, Live Long, Die Short, about challenging yeah, you your did. brain. And so, and you mentioned specifically music and language. So because I'm the overachiever, I had to do both. I started uh, taking piano lessons. And I also, you know, got on Babbel and did a few French lessons. I'm not fluent. But what was interesting with the piano, it hurt my brain to the point of when I was done practice, I felt like my brain was fatigued, like I had gone to the gym and lifted weights. Now you say that that was a good thing. So I'm like, I'm going to keep it up. And you know what? After two months of making my brain hurt, All of a sudden, like I had all this super energy, like problem solving was better. My concentration was better. My creativity was like off the charts. And suddenly, you know, at the end of the workday, I still had more ideas. Okay, I got to get these ideas down because I was in this flow. So to me, there was just like this two months going from brain fog to like feeling like I had this super brain. So I have you to thank for that, Roger. Well... I'd like to think that I played a major role, but uh, I think you probably would have done that anyway. But you know what you were doing? You were becoming the architect of your brain. And what was happening was uh, related to this new thing we've learned about the brain, neuroplasticity. So this is, uh, this is something started to come to light maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago. And it's basically the lifelong ability of the brain to rewire itself. I bet you didn't know that was happening, right? You were rewiring your brain. That was what kept no. me going. <laughs> Roger so says we, this is helping. <laughs> so when we challenge ourselves uh, to learn new things, new things, uh, if you're doing things that you're always doing, you know, you've got a neural pathway doing that, and you can keep doing it and doing it, and that little pathway will become a super highway so that will happen but when you learn new things you actually make new connections you keep at it the you know the little trail gets to be a little a uh, little road and then a super highway and so this is actually happening we can even see it on brain scans where say someone's learning a new language in the language area as if we take sequential brain scans that area of the brain's getting heavier and thicker or actually building new brain pathways. It's it's incredible stuff because, you know, in medical school, I was taught that, you know, the brain, it got to be its best and you were at your best. And after that, it was all downhill. You were only losing function. And here I know now we're all the architects of our brain. You know, if we use them, they're going to respond. Yeah. And we have to be willing to be uncomfortable, right? I think that's what Danielle was feeling were those um, brain cells growing and creating new connections. And and that's the slightly painful part. And we have to be willing to get uncomfortable enough. And I think it's important that we permission ourselves to be a beginner at something that, and start from scratch so that we can attempt something that's new to us and, and novel and, and complex. Oh, that's a whole attitude, isn't it? You know, you know, during our lives, we, we, we're struggling for competence when we're younger. So we always want to, when we learn something new, we want to learn it really well, you know, and maybe enter the Olympics, I mean, metaphorically speaking. But in some cases, truly, we want to do it. And if we can't, then we don't do it. Ah, oh, that is such a mistake. The brain is so much better just by, the, by attempting something new. You may fail at it or you may not be good at it. But it's going to be good for you. I mean, because these new neural pathways, they're sort of like redundant pathways so that if your regular pathways gets all potholed with life, 
injuries or sickness or, or, you know, just wearing out with uh, being overused or whatever, or age, uh, then these other pathways can take over. It's a great story with uh, Jill Bolte Taylor, who had a stroke at age 39. Now, she was a neuroanatomist at Harvard, wrote a book, My Stroke of Insight, great book and uh, but basically describes what happened to her she couldn't walk or talk but she knew about neuroplasticity so she did everything she needed took a few years but you can see her on a ted talk she never thought this woman would ever have a stroke that is so optimistic isn't it that 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 we are the architects of our brain and it sounds like it's almost threefold what you're saying so you know you learn something new and then you repeat that activity and then you maintain so that pathway gets like a super highway but then you can't stop there you always have to learn something that's going to make your brain hurt like once I learn that song I need to learn a new song I need to do something to mix it up right to to have the new pathways and the really cool thing is having something in reserve so that if you have a pothole or something happens like a brain injury that you have all these other pathways in reserve then you can take a detour right uh, but you know me and zealotry so I mean it's, it I, I kind of you know uh, it, it bothers me a little bit when someone goes over the top. So this doesn't have to be some lifelong pressuring yourself to learn something new. I think it's what Teresa said. You said, be a beginner. Just be willing to be a beginner and have a curious mind and follow your passion, you know, and don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to, you know, th- this isn't junior high anymore. No one's going to make fun of you. So, you know, just get out there and and try it, you know. Right. Actually failing is part of the success in this case, right? The more we fail, the more we learn and grow and create those, those new connections in the brain. So in some ways, maybe the goal should be try something new and fail a lot until you, until you do get it. And I tell you what, I am still terrible at the piano, (laughs) but what, what it does for me is helps in all these other areas. When I'm writing, when I'm, again, problem solving, when I'm trying to figure out a solution that nobody can figure out, it's all the other areas that it comes into play. So I might not be good at that, but think of all the other benefits. So even if you do something and you fail at it, you're really not failing. That is absolutely true. And, you know, in addition to all that, you know, people worry about dementia you know they worry about do I you know maybe someone in the family had some dementia and and what can I do about that that seems like a stroke out of the out of the blue and there's nothing much I can do but you know the nun study was in the midwest and they followed these nuns because they were living a long time and so they looked at many things and during this study they happened to find that on autopsy some some of these nuns had Alzheimer brains with the plaques tangled nerves and yet didn't have symptoms this was incredible news and they didn't know what was going on. So uh, they finally determined, and this is mainline uh, science now, that to the extent that we use our brain. Now, these nuns were both intellectually and physically active. They were learning things and they were very physical. And that lifestyle that allowed them to, to grow these redundant pathways. And what we're thinking is going on is that living that lifestyle helps us put off the onset of symptoms, even when our brain is changing for the worse, namely that it's getting the plaques and the tangles that, you know, you're building new pathways to allow you to function normally, even though that's happening like Jill Taylor. I've read uh, recently that bilingualism delays dementia by about five years. And that sounds like just more evidence of, of um, living that lifestyle of, of being a lifelong learner um, that helps us age in a better way. Grazie, Teresa. I just came <laughs> from Italy. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do that. You, you've you learned some Portuguese, right? You invested a lot in Portuguese. So your brain scan shows it. And, well, I, you know, we have to be practical. You know, people do worry about their brain. And, and how can we keep it, you know, functioning at its best? So I think we've talked about, you know, moving. And, you know, all the things we talk about on this show all would help brain function but certainly moving and learning new things. We know diet's an important part. You know, eating uh, a plant-based diet uh, is tremendously helpful. Low fats, uh, tremendously helpful for uh, lower incidence and prevalence of, uh, of dementia. 
Uh, you know, we see it in uh, in the blue zones once again. And, uh, you know, eating regularly, uh, our brains aren't meant to, that they don't do well with low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. So long periods of fasting, not good for the brain. So, you know, like our hunter-gatherer ancestors, we, we kind of, I'm, and I tend to be a grazer, you know, I don't just eat one meal or two meals. I tend to eat like four or five small meals a day. And that keeps up the level of blood sugar. So those things are all helpful. But you know something else that's a real threat? To Danielle, you know about this. This, you know, just the stress that we we have and our chattering minds. You know, a lot of times our memory problems really aren't that we have a memory problem is that we're not paying attention. I think you were reading my mind uh, because I was going to say the flip side is, yes, you want to challenge your brain, but there are many of us who never shut their brains off. And there's a danger in not giving your brain a chance to recover. So I am very big on advocating mindfulness activities and meditation. I've probably gotten about a dozen people the last week to sign up for Insight Timer if they need an, a phone app to actually learn how to, to meditate. So some of the other benefits of mindfulness and meditation as part of brain training is it, it helps with your concentration, your memory. It, it helps you with social engagement because it helps you be more present when other people are speaking. And I talked a bit about the creativity, focus, emotional stability, and better mood. So those were the same benefits I mentioned about working the brain. You kind of need to to practice both sides, knowing when to shut it off, too. In creativity, Danielle, uh, Einstein once said that his greatest ideas came when he wasn't thinking, when he shut down his mind, his chattering mind, and he was just in the present. And that's when he got these these great ideas that came to him. And then he would work the idea, of course, with his mind. But the actual creativity was enhanced by quieting the mind, it seems counterintuitive. We're the architects of our brain, you know. And the good news is that unlike in me- when I was in medical school, where this was sort of a, an organ that is at its best and then only declined, it's dynamic and it's relate. Go figure. It's related to our lifestyle and all the things we're talking about: moving, learning, social connection here, even purpose. Uh, that that all enhances our brain function. So we can't get away from this lifestyle thing. You know that? I'm going to go out and architect the hell out of my brain. We hope this podcast is a source of inspiration. If you're ready to dive deeper into these concepts and really apply them in your life, join us over at Master Life. You'll have a personalized experience and lots of support to create your own long, bright future. MyMasterLife.com You've been listening to Dr. Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity. If you like the show, please rate and review, and be sure to click to follow. 